All right, well, let's go ahead and get started with this lesson one of the women of the Bible. Father God, we give you all praise and glory and honor. And thank you, Lord, that you not only hear our prayers, but you gave us your word. And as we study these women, these familiar stories we've heard over and over again, Lord, we ask that you open our eyes to new and exciting things as we learn from their life experiences and how they handled the situations you placed them in. May we learn from them as well in Jesus' name. All right, so we've got more women joining us. How wonderful. Thank you for joining in on this lesson one of the women of the Bible. I'm so excited to go through this with you because I prayed and prayed about what I should be teaching next uh, while we were in our Knowing Christ study. And the Lord just really laid it on me to go over these women again, these women we've known for many, many years, but he is showing me exciting things as I study them. So let's start with Eve. So remember, no one person is mentioned in the Bible without a purpose or a plan. And that purpose and plan is to point us to Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, the Christ. So look at the names there and think in your mind, how do they point us to Jesus? And that's what we're going to be thinking about as we study them. We can glean so much from the women of the Bible. I know sometimes we judge them a little too harshly, like Eve, right, or Mary and Martha. And sometimes we might venerate these women too highly, like Ruth or Esther or Mary, the mother of Jesus. But one thing is for sure, we should always study them, the situations God placed them in and how they handled their circumstances. But lastly, we should study how God used them to forward his kingdom. Isn't that what we want? We want to be used by God to forward his kingdom. Now, many non-believers think that God is misogynist and he's a tyrant and he always treats women terribly, but that's not true. If you study God's word, you will see that God loves these women and he not only loved them, but he used them to further his kingdom. And by studying their lives and what God did through them, we can grow as believers in Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to do. We can learn how they handled their circumstances, both the good ways and the bad ways. And you'll find that we can see ourselves in many of these women. And when we do, we'll see that we too are part of God's story and how he can use us to further his kingdom. So welcome to this new study. Lesson one, the study of Eve, the mother of all living. If you're just joining me, I apologize again for not having a PowerPoint. I ran out of time (laughs) this week. It was crazy busy. So I'm just using the uh, Word document lesson. But I will have a PowerPoint next week. So let's study Genesis 3. That's where we're going to start our study in Genesis 3. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So remember those two names, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So before we begin, let's put Eve's story in its proper perspective by asking the journalistic question. So who? Many scholars believe Moses was the one who wrote the book of Genesis. And in the first two chapters, we read about the creation of everything in the universe and then specific details of the creation of man and woman. When did this happen? Well, many scholars remain perplexed as to when the story of Eve was written. For now, they believe it was over 5,000 years ago. What is this story? Well, it's a narrative. It's a story of Eve, and it begins with the creation of Adam. His placement in the Garden of Eden and his defined role as the keeper of the garden and all the animals. Where is the story told? It's told in the Garden of Eden that God created in the East. Why is it told? I believe the story of Eve is to reveal more of God's character as is the purpose of all the books in the Bible, all the stories. 
is also to point us to Jesus, the coming Messiah. How is it written? It's written as a narrative, but remember, it's not fictional. It's a story, but a true story. So we find that God created all living things, a way for the living things to have sustainable life, and then he created man to be the keeper of all living things. And it sounds perfect, right? But not to God, because God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Those are the blank, the fill in the blanks. So picture the scene in your mind. Adam is the keeper of every living, living creature thing, and God orders every living creature thing to come before Adam so he could name it. Because he was created with the ability to think critically, right, he figures out on his own that not one living creature he has seen so far resembles himself. And does God put the onus on Adam to find a helper suitable for himself? No. God provides the helper. And he puts Adam to sleep. And this tells us that Adam's input was not needed nor wanted. And neither is our input in anything that God does. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, he formed into woman. And brought her to the man. I'm going to pull up the scripture over here so I can have it with me as I'm reading. Oops, I misspelled the word Genesis. So as you can see here, this is different than all the other creatures, including man. God made woman specifically, you know, in a very specific way out of flesh. And notice how it was God who brought the woman to the man. So we have a picture there of the marriage ceremony, the Jewish marriage ceremony, whereas it is the father of the groom who selects the bride for his son. And here we have that beautiful picture again. It is God who brought the woman, the first wife, to the man, the first husband. And Eve must have had unsurpassed beauty. Because God formed man out of the dirt and all created living things by his word. But Eve, she was created from living flesh and formed by God's hand. And we know she was something special just from Adam's reaction when he saw her. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Sorry, I had a cough there. <laughs> and she was named Eve, which means mother of all living. <clears throat> I was singing a lot at the Hillsong <clears throat> concert last night, so I don't have much of a voice. So I apologize. I'm going to cough one more time. Okay. So she was named Eve, which means mother of all living. And Adam noticed that she was different from all the living creatures that he had just named. He noticed she is special. And then the fall happens. <laughs> and we all know that story, right? We're all familiar with it. Genesis 3.3. Now the serpent was craftier than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Of course, we cannot study Eve without mentioning the fall of mankind into sin, because this inciting incident directly affects you and me, even to this day. But I don't want to focus solely on the fall. I also want to focus on Eve as a broken woman mended by God. And notice how the author mentions the serpent was craftier than any other beast God had made. God had made the serpent in this manner. Not as crafty as human beings, but it was made with the ability to also think and to think critically. Why did he do that? Well, remember, this is God's story. And in God's story, we have a hero. and We also have a villain. That hero is Jesus and the villain is Satan. And remember, as a writer, I know, and if you ever do creative writing, you must find a connection between your villain and your hero. There has to be. I mean, think of all the great 
classics and literature. Think of the movies you've seen. You have a villain, but somehow he or she is connected to your main character, whether it's envy or jealousy or even by relations, right? Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. But in this story, God's story, the great perfect storyteller, our hero Jesus is connected to the serpent. And God wanted it that way as a foretelling of what is to come. So why does it matter that the serpent was so crafty? And think about it. Why did he go to the woman and not the man? And remember, even Eve wasn't even created yet when God commanded Adam not to eat of certain trees in Genesis 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, right? And the Lord commanded him, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Remember the names of the trees. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Many commentators say that means of a conscience. If you eat of that tree, you're given a conscience. Now you know the difference between good and evil. And he said, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Eve wasn't even created yet when God said that. So why didn't the serpent go up and talk to Adam? Hmm. Now, this is purely speculation. Could it be that he knew Adam didn't accurately explain the command to Eve? Or was it because the serpent knew Eve could be manipulated easily? Well, that's just speculation. But we must only go by what we have in scripture. And in scripture, we have, we know the story that Eve fell for the serpent's cunning. He twisted God's word and she twisted it. She went by sight. And then she ate of the forbidden tree. But remember also, Adam sinned because he was there too. And Adam sinned and ate the fruit. And the devil's plan <clears throat> is to always create disunity. Remember, they said that last night uh, at the Hillsong concert. One of the singers said that we are all the churches to remain united. The devil's trying to separate us, right? He's trying to divide us <clears throat> because <clears throat> that's what he does. He separates. He causes disunity, disunity in marriage, between parents and children, and in the church. So here he is causing disunity in the first marriage ever created. But that was part of the plan. Nothing ever happens outside of God's plan. So you can rest in that. Nothing ever surprises God. God wasn't up there, you know, putting wings on angels. And one of the angels said, God, look what's happening in the garden. And God was like, oh, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> this was all part of God's perfect plan. And that plan is to point us to Jesus and his perfect plan sacrifice. But they sinned, and then the consequences of sin happened. So we remember, after they ate, right, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them because they, their eyes were open. He said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. So their eyes were open. They were ashamed that they were naked. So God said, lest, now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life, that was the other tree, and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Wow. Eve, the mother of all living. Sometimes when we read this story, we judge Eve harshly because of the curse that she was given. Remember, God said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. I've only had one kid, but some of you have had many. So you know that pain of childbearing. In pain, God said, you shall bring forth children. And your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So that was the curse. So God made garments for them. He clothed them. He cursed Adam. He cursed the serpent. He cursed Eve. And then he said, we must kick them out because we don't want them to eat of the other tree. 
And so sometimes we tend to judge Eve harshly because of that pain of childbirth was greatly increased and the land was cursed. But think about this. You and I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit guiding us. Eve didn't have that. You and I have the complete revelation of God. Eve didn't have that. You and I can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and gain wisdom and discernment. Eve didn't have that. We have all these gifts of God, and yet you and I rebel and disobey God daily. So who are we to judge her? Instead, what can we learn from what happened in the Garden of Eden? So let's look at Eve as mother and co-worker with her husband, Adam. Now, this was Adam's curse. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. I'm sorry, let me make sure I got that. Yeah, in pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So Adam's punishment was to work a cursed ground for the rest of his life. It would produce fruit for him, but he would have to work and have pain and sweat in order to obtain that fruit. Have you ever tried to till the hard ground? I mean, in Phoenix, this ground is hard. And sometimes when I'm working the ground, uh, it has concrete in it. But even with modern tools, it's still a chore. But imagine having to work the ground, the hardened, cursed ground with just your hands, with rocks or sticks. And if you didn't, you would starve to death. Because God said you will eat of the plants of the field. So that meant they were going to have to plant the field, right? Plant those plants. But Eve was right there helping Adam, her husband. Now imagine they're kicked out of the garden with perfect bodies. Their bodies are without blemish or mark. But now after tilling the hardened ground for weeks upon weeks and year upon year, their backs are bent from using those hard from tilling the hard ground and using those man-made tools, their hands are, their palms of their hands are calloused and hardened. Their brown skin is leathered from being in the hot sun day after day. Imagine the moles and the freckles all over their once perfect skin. Imagine the wrinkles on their faces from the worry. I remember when I, I was only like 23 when I first saw wrinkles on my face because I, my husband was overseas in war and I was worried about him and I couldn't believe it. I already had wrinkles at such a young age. Well, imagine the wrinkles on their faces from the worry of not even knowing where their next meal would come from. And if you want to understand the stress, talk to a farmer's wife. I have. I interviewed a farmer's wife because she wrote a book. Uh, on my podcast, I interviewed her and she said, it takes so much faith because you can buy a bag of seeds and till the ground and make it fertile and lush and you can plant the seed and water it, but you still have to wait on the Lord because we have no control. The farmers have no control over the elements or if that little seed will even split and produce the plant that yields its fruit. They have no control. But God. We know from reading further into Genesis that God did provide, didn't he? He gave Adam and Eve critical thinking skills to make those tools and to make shelter. He gave them bodies that are, that are capable of working. And he gave them food from the ground. We know that because of the first fruits in chapter four. So here's what happened to them. They went from paradise where they had everything to a cursed ground, hardened, and they had thorns and thistles that they had to deal with. 
Now it says in chapter four, now Adam knew his wife and she bore, um, gave birth and bore Cain. So that word knew, Adam knew means they had intercourse. So they were sexually intimate and she became pregnant and she bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of the sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. So though that sentence there tells us they were successful. They were successful in tilling that earth and breeding. They had critical thinking skills, so they knew how to breed the sheep. And they knew that now they had to eat the sheep to live and, you know, harvest the fruit from the ground. So they taught their sons how to do this. That's amazing, isn't it? Now let's look at Eve as mother. Now she is the first mother on earth. All the days of her life, Eve never knew a time without the presence of God. So he could no longer walk with him as he did in the garden. But he was still there. He was still there. And he provided for them. Remember, he was the one in control of the elements. So if they planted the seed, you know, in the ground, he caused the water not to come from the sky because it hadn't rained yet, but to come from below. And that's how he watered the garden and the earth was from below, from the mist of the ground. So he was still providing for them. He allowed the sheep to breed and grow and, and have a herd because Abel was the first shepherd ever created. So she never knew a time without the presence of God. After being thrown out of paradise, remember, the cherubim and the flaming sword were placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden, her former home. We like to think when we read the book of Genesis and the story of creation, we think it happened in like one week. The creation did, according to God, but it doesn't mean that they were in the Garden of Eden for one 24-hour time period and then they were kicked out. <laughs> it seems that way when we read it, but I feel that they were probably there with God for quite a while. And they had um, formed this schedule, like this routine. And in the cool of the day, God would walk in the garden and that's when he would talk with them. But that was all gone. That was her former home. And she must have looked over that way and saw that flaming sword and that beautiful garden. And it was probably a constant reminder of the sin she and Adam had committed and the results. They lost access to paradise. And they saw the cursings on the ground. That paradise was diminished. And now the ground was cursed. How tragic is that? Can you imagine living with a constant reminder of the sin you committed. And not only that, but seeing day after day what it cost you. Looking at your once perfect skin now all leathered and your back all bent, you know, and your face and everything. Oh, I just can't even imagine that going from perfection to now torn and tattered because of your sin. Do you see now how this story is pointing us to Jesus? Yeah, but God, he did not forsake nor forget his finest creation, Adam and Eve. And I don't know if you've ever read the poem, um, Lost Paradise, but this epic poem was written as a way to kind of visualize the scene where Satan is kicked out of heaven, uh, out of uh, paradise, out of um, the presence of God with all of his demons after he turned, after Lucifer turned into Satan and all of the demons all who went with him in this betrayal of God were kicked out into the lake of fire. And in the lake of fire, according to this poem, Satan is devising a way to get back at God. And he looks at God's finest creation, Adam and Eve. And he, from that moment, devises a plan to destroy them. And then that's when he goes to Eve to tempt them. But before he does, he watches them. And I love this part of the poem because he watches them with envy because he sees how perfect they are, but he also sees the close personal relationship they have with God, the Father. 
And even though a lot of um, criti critiques of the poem say, it's almost like he's pitying Satan. And I agree when you read it, you think, yeah, he kind of does pity, you know, Lucifer and everything. But at the same time, it makes you appreciate that common bond, the beautiful bond that Adam and Eve had with God. God walked with them in the garden. How beautiful is that? And yet, even after they were kicked out of the garden, God didn't forsake them. And we know that. How? Because of Eve's words. Adam and Eve, they didn't shake their fists in anger and say, curse you, God, I hate you. No. Even after working that cursed ground for years and finding a way to survive. No. Instead, they acknowledged his presence and provisions. When her son was born, Eve said, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She didn't say with the help of my husband, right? Or with the help of the creation. No, she said with the help of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So think about your own life. When you have gone through some difficult times, it does sometimes feel like God is not there or that maybe he's just putting all this on your shoulders and it hurts and you think it's not fair. But think of Eve, what she endured because of the stupid mistake of twisting God's word, of not listening to her husband, of, of listening to the serpent and taking that fruit and eating it. She lost everything. But she still worked alongside her husband, and she still gave glory to God for the gift of her son. Wow. Would we do that? Would we be like that? Or would we curse God? Well, we see here in this verse that Eve still acknowledged and honored God for the gift of her son. Would we honor God even as we saw that flaming sword reminder? of what we did to earn the curse of working the ground and an increase of pain in childbirth? I don't know, would we? So now we see her sons. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of times, so this is many years, Cain brought the Lord to the Lord, what? An offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So isn't that amazing? I think it's beautiful that even though Adam and Eve suffered tremendous consequences for their sin, as did all of creation, the atmosphere, the ground, you know, the animals, everything suffered. It was now cursed. Yet Adam and Eve still taught their sons to honor God with the first fruits of their labor. They, they were taught to bring an offering of the fruit of the ground and of the firstborn of the flock. What does that remind you of, right? Do you see how this story points us to Jesus? There must be an offering to God. And it must be a first fruit. It must be pleasing to God. So would we do that? Do we do that today? When things are going well, it's easy to glorify God. But as soon as things turn sour, do we still give God everything? Do we give him our first fruits? Now I have a friend right now whose husband is dying of cancer. And I've asked some of you to pray for her and him, Brian and Jennifer and their son, Benjamin. He's near the end of his life. Now, for the entire marriage, 23-year marriage, he has been suffering from cancer. He has always been sick. Can you imagine that? Her entire 23-year time with her husband, he has been sick. And yet, she has never cursed God. She has always glorified him. She gives us updates on his treatment and everything for the nine years that I've known her. And she'll always post scripture. She'll say, this is the verse that's getting me through the day this week. This is a scripture. That's a scripture. And these are verses that are praising God. These are verses that David wrote when he was hiding from King Saul in the caves. And she's asking us to read these verses and give glory 
to God. And this was for nine years, her husband has been suffering through tremendous surgeries and radiation treatments and chemotherapy. He's had all kinds of cancer and surgeries and kidney failure, everything. And not just that, but their son, Benjamin, was born with a deformed esophagus. So he had to have an esophagus created inside of his body because he was born with that one. And so since birth, their son has been sick. He has a strict diet, dietary needs. He's 22 now, and he's doing well. And even then, this woman has had to be caretaker for her son for 22 years and her husband for 23 years. And when I talk to her today, she's still asking us to pray to a God she loves and trusts. How amazing is that? Would I do that if my husband were sick like that? I don't know. I would like to think I would, but I don't know. I can't say. But I can look to her, Jennifer, as an example, just like I can look to Eve as an example of when you are going through difficult times, you still honor the Lord. You still teach your children to honor God. And Jennifer and Brian did. They have taught uh, Benjamin to honor God. And it is such a testament, a witness to how God is. So sometimes it gets me down when I think of the sexual sin that I committed when I was in college and such. And I see the repercussions to this day of those actions. So it's almost like I see that flaming sword at the entrance of the garden reminding me of sin and its consequences. Would I continue, you know, to curse God along if if I saw all that? Well, sometimes it's hard and I feel as though I'm cursed. But then I remember Jesus and his sacrifice. And that's what this story wants us to do. In the pain of her suffering, in the pain of the consequences of her sins, Eve still glorified God. She and her husband taught their sons how to take the first fruits of their labor and give it back to the Lord. How beautiful is that? That's what we must do. Even if we are going through difficult times, we must still teach our children to honor the Lord with the fruits, first fruits of their labor. So how can we learn from everything? How can we apply what we've learned so far about Eve, right? We can trust the Lord. First, just by studying his word, you and I are already headed in the right direction. That's what we're supposed to do. We are willing to look at God's word for guidance. And we are willing to look inward at our own hearts for ways we are rebelling against him, the very holy God. And we must immediately seek for forgiveness. It says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, John was writing that letter to the church, to believers of Jesus. So he's saying, even if you are a believer in Jesus and you sin, confess it. And Jesus is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. So how has Eve's story helped you lean on God for guidance, wisdom, and discernment? Think about it. Now, next, we can learn from Eve's actions and attitudes. Even though she lived in utter paradise, the complete, you know, perfect environment, she still wanted more, didn't she? She coveted what she did not have. She listened to the serpent twist God's word around. Has he not had, did he really say that if you ate from it, you would die? And she listened to that and she believed the serpent's words over God's words. She went by sight and she started to covet what she did not have. Why do we do that? Why do we look around and Praise God for all that we have. And then, oh, we look at the neighbors. Oh, look what they have, right? And what consequences can we expect from doing that? Well, discontentment for one, right? And then we'll fall into sin because we'll start to want what we don't have. and We'll start to do whatever we can to get it. So we can learn from her actions and her attitudes. 
And then lastly, we can learn from Eve's example. Even though she lost everything and had to work the hard ground with her husband, she did not curse God. She acknowledged her firstborn son was of the Lord, not of her own doing, not of her husband's doing, but of the Lord. So that meant she still sensed the presence of God in her life. And she, along with her husband, taught her sons to honor God with the fruit of their hands. Isn't that amazing? And obviously, she and Adam had succeeded in working the ground and managing creation because they bred sheep and they planted gardens that brought forth fruit. So we can learn from their example of faith and trust in God's provisions because they knew God personally. They trusted him. So think about this story. What did you learn about Eve today that maybe you hadn't thought of before? And what did you learn about God that perhaps you hadn't thought of before? And how did this study of Eve point you to Jesus? The story of Eve is a poignant one indeed. We sometimes want to hate her because of that curse, right? But we should truly appreciate her in the midst of a terrible storm that she helped bring upon herself and Adam. And I know what that's like. I've done that too. But she still honored God. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that the example that Jesus gave us when he walked the earth? I thank you for joining me. And next time, we're going to study uh, the story of Ruth and learn even more about God's attributes. So until then, think about it. What did you learn about God today that may have comforted you or challenged you? I thank you so much for joining me today, ladies. And I hope that you're excited about studying these ladies, these women of the word. And I hope you learned something new today. I know I did when I studied this uh, story of Eve again. God really wanted me to focus on her as being a woman and a mother. And it really did come through for me today. So thank you, Dee. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to studying Ruth. That's one of my favorite lessons in the Bible. So let's pray. I thank you for joining me, and then we'll be about the rest of our day. Father God, thank you so much for giving this the story of Eve, and we can glean so much from it. And we praise your name, God, that you are speaking to our hearts right now, showing us how we are supposed to handle our circumstances that sometimes we bring upon ourselves, and sometimes the circumstances that you bring upon us. But we always know is to make us stronger, is to reveal your attributes to us. And it's to always point us to the need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for each lady joining me today, Lord, and her faithfulness, her willingness to come learn more about your word. Father, bless her with every spiritual blessing for that. She took time out of her day, Lord, to seek you and honor you. And I pray that you would bless her. And Father, I pray for Jennifer and Brian and Benjamin this day as they were suffering and going through this difficult time. Please let them feel held. And let them know that the saints are praying for them. Let them feel your presence there, Lord, and give them peace that passes all understanding. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks, ladies. You are such a blessing to me. I do too. Thanks for joining. See you next time. Thank you, Carol. God bless.